Good afternoon. I think it's almost afternoon. Uh, we're about to start our lunch session, but uh, we have a, a special announcement. As you heard directly from her this morning, Miss America, Nina Davaluri, is currently in Dallas and could not travel down due to inclement weather. However, in the true IIT spirit, failure is not an option. We have a phone interview set up with Miss America. Please remember you can submit questions to her via the mobile app uh, online, same way you've been doing that for all of our speakers. So moderating this session is Sunday Sirini Vasan. Please welcome Sunday to the stage. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Enjoyed the conference? Ready to talk to Miss America? A little bit louder. However, ladies and gentlemen, before we do that, let's relive the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, your new Miss America is Miss New York. Miss New York, Nina Davaluri. It's happened again. Two years in a row. What a moment for Mallory and for New York. America, the runway is yours. Good afternoon, uh, Nina. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. In fact, uh, thank you for uh, finding the time to do this for all of us. Uh, Absolutely. I'm, My pleasure. Yeah, I'm uh, Sandy Srinivasan from the IIT 2013 Global Conference, and I am Nina in a room packed with people. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to getting a conversation started. Yeah, very good. Uh, so, Nina, uh, the audience has been uh, sending me a lot of interesting questions. So, here's the first one for you. Okay. Do you have any advice for all of the people who have taken you as their role model and inspiration? Oh, my goodness, of course. Um, and I always first and foremost say be yourself. And it's so much easier said than done, and it's very easy to lose yourself, especially in today's society. And I can't tell you how many people told me, Nina, if you're really serious about winning Miss New York or winning Miss America, change your talent, because Bollywood will never win. And for me, it was something I really struggled with, um, because obviously this has always been a dream of mine, um, but it really came down to was that, you know, Indian dancing, my culture, my heritage was a huge part of who I was. And I couldn't imagine doing any other thing um, on the Miss America stage. And I knew if I was going to win Miss America, I had to be in my way and in my terms. So I always say, know who you are, love who you are, and stand up for who you are. Wow. 
That's uh, excellent, Nina. So here's a, uh, you know, you're in an audience full of uh, engineers, so here's a half technical question for you. <laughs> okay. What's your favorite color and why? My favorite color is pink. Yes, I'm a girl. Um, uh, my whole bedroom is pink, actually, growing up. Um, but my favorite colors to wear are yellow and um, white. Very good. Uh, so here, again, is a question on uh, being Indian American. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, uh, what do you, you believe, in fact, is the best part of being an Indian American? Well, I really have to attribute a lot of that to my parents. And um, I, always, I always say it, that they've always been supportive, but not necessarily encouraging. Um, but I'm so thankful that my parents have allowed me to share their story on a national level because it truly has been difficult. Um, it, it was a struggle growing up in America, keeping those Indian values. And so um, I think what, what I really have learned from this experience is that assimilation really has to happen from both sides because you simply can't raise your children in America expecting them to be fully Indian. It's just not going to happen. And so I'm really proud of my parents for being able to under understand that and accept that. And also um, myself as well, being able to still have my Indian values and roots and heritage, um, but assimilate that with the American culture. Well, that's, that's excellent. I'm, I'm sure uh, <clears throat> a lot of uh, the people here uh, are, as you uh, probably know, are disappointed that you couldn't be here in person. I know, me too. They are absolutely delighted to be having this opportunity to uh, uh, chat with you. So here's another one for you. This is actually a statement, and that'll be interesting for you to hear as well. It okay. says, Dear Miss America, I owe you an apology. <laughs> he says, In a recent chat with some techie friends of mine, I remarked stupidly about why should a beauty queen be invited to a technical conference. I undermined your achievement, this gentleman in the audience says and the power of being a role model such as yourself. I have a three-year-old daughter, and she told me, if I don't apologize, I'm going to be in trouble. So he says, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. That's so very kind. Um, you know, it's really interesting because being in the pageant world, we automatically face a stereotype. Um, I walk into a room with a crown on my head, and people think, oh, that's cute. And I've always taken the initiative to first and foremost present myself in a sort of scholastic standpoint. And having a role, a title like Miss America, um, you're absolutely correct. I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm a role model for younger girls, younger children out there. And it's so relevant and so timely now more than ever because our country has swung so far to one side of the pendulum in terms of what is good, what is wholesome, what is pure. And we're ready and hungry for it to swing back. And that's exactly who Miss America is. And that's my job this year is to be that attainable role model. No, excellent. <clears throat> so here's an interesting one for you. When you did become Miss America, uh, there was a lot of opposition, for want of a better word. <laughs> so there, uh, there's an interesting question from the audience is, how did you deal with, uh, with, with that kind of a situation and that opposition, uh, if you like, for want of a better word? Right. Yeah, um, of course it was difficult, and sadly it was something I experienced when I, on a much smaller scale when I won the title of Miss New York. And, um, you know, when I won, I had people call me a terrorist. I had people post pictures on social media of women in headscarves, which is a completely different misconception in itself. And I remember sitting with my mom and sister. My sister is my best friend. Um, we're only 18 months apart. And... Um, you know, I said, why is this happening? Because I've always first and foremost viewed myself as American. I was born in Syracuse, New York. My platform was celebrating diversity through cultural competency. And these were educated people saying these remarks. And in my mind, it was just absolutely intolerable. And hindsight really is 2020 because if that hadn't happened when I won Miss New York, I'm not sure if I would have been able to handle it as eloquently as I did when I won Miss America. Um, and I knew that it would probably happen, obviously, on a much larger scale. But the silver lining with everything that happened is that it has now given me a voice. Um, and people are starting this discussion um, not only nationally but globally. 
And for every one negative comment, tweet, or post, I received hundreds and now thousands, really, of positive words of encouragement and support, not only from the Indian community, not only from Americans, but really people all across the world. And that kind of support has been, has been truly amazing. Yeah, and all those positive comments, absolutely well-deserved, as this entire audience is going to tell you with a show of hands and a round of applause here. <laughs> Thank you. So we did uh, play, in fact, uh, Nina, this morning, uh, not only your crowning moment, but we played your wonderful uh, uh, Bollywood fusion dance uh, that, that you did yeah. as part of the competition. Mm -hmm. So there's a question related to that, uh, I guess, and not, not meaning to kind of lead you anywhere, but what's your favorite part of Indian culture? <laughs> of course, dancing, first and foremost. Um, I grew up Indian dancing, or I grew up classically trained in Bharatanatyam. Um, my mom's uh, family still lives in India, so we would go back every year, every summer, um, ever since I can remember, really. And um, I remember saying to my mom, I don't want to take dance class today. And she said, well, we already paid the dance master, so you have to go. <laughs> and, of course, I listened to my mother. And so um, I trained in that for many years throughout high school as well. Um, and then uh, Bollywood was always something that was the fun part. It came easy to me. Um, and in college, I joined two Indian fusion dance teams. So I was really involved in it. Um, it was, you know, a part of who I was. So, like I said, there was no other way that I was, there was no other talent I could imagine doing. Um, but actually, I did a different dance when I won Miss New York. And then um, the Miss America organization, ABC, wouldn't clear my initial song that I had had. Um, so I had to completely pick a new song, and I did Doom Sana from Om Shanti Om. Um, and I learned that talent in two days. I went out to L.A. and trained with the Bollywood choreographer from So You Can Teach and Dance, um, two very intense days, um, and really only had two weeks to learn my talent. I won um, Miss New York in July, and then Miss America was in September, so it was a really quick turnaround, but um, it, was, it was a perfect piece to do. No, that's uh, <laughs> great, because I, I was just kind of smiling here because you – kind of walked into the next question, you know, I'm, I'm getting the questions here on the podium, oh. which is, uh, having been to India, the question is, have you visited any IIT campus? I have not, <laughs> um, actually, but I would love to. So now, of course, everyone is screaming, ID Madras, ID Karakpur, yeah, and so on and so forth, right? <clears throat> so let me tell you something, uh, uh, and you can take my word on it, IIT Delhi is the place to go, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, I've got into trouble here already with yeah. that one, Nina. <laughs> the audience doesn't sound too happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, here's an interesting question for you, and I'm sure you're pretty much used to by now, you know, s uh, skipping from topic to topic, and you're doing an excellent job, by the way. Isn't she doing an excellent job, guy, ladies and gentlemen? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, what do you plan on doing next? Uh, what's next for you? Acting? Well, actually, so in my mind, I'm very type A, um, and I have to have a plan for everything. And so in my mind, I thought, well, great, I'm going to win Miss America and then start medical school right away um, because that's what was supposed to happen. But actually, that now can't happen um, because I will not finish my year of service until end of September next year, and schools obviously start early August, September. Um, and it's just not a possibility. And even, you know, finishing a year like Miss America, you need a little bit of time to, I suppose, be reintroduced into society because right now I live in a bubble, um, and it's, it's very difficult to comprehend that. Um, so I will actually have a year of open, um, I suppose, an open window um, to explore other options that come my way. Um, but definitely I will absolutely go back to graduate school. Um, I think it's so important now. It's not only about a college degree. I'm, um, it's really about you need a higher level of education to set yourself apart. Um, and, of course, I won $50,000 in scholarship money, so I have to use that towards my education. Um, but, yeah, as far as the close next year, I'm not 100% sure, but um, definitely continue my education after that. Give her a hand, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> so tell me, Nina, uh, you went to the University of uh, Michigan and... Uh, uh -huh. So there's a gentleman here that wants to inform you that his dad went there and he was planning oh, to great. go there as well. So the That's que awesome. <laughs> question for you on the University of Michigan. What was your favorite part of the University of Michigan? 
Football Saturday. Um, I actually one of the ex- <laughs> one of the exciting things I got to do recently as Miss America was they invited me back to the um, Michigan Ohio State game. Um, tough, heartbreaking game, but I was right on the field um, the entire time and was introduced during halftime and everything, and got to bring my family and friends with me. So that was a a memory that will last forever. So that was really exciting. And there's one thing for sure that I can tell you that I, w- I wish really that you could, you could see what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing a room uh, full of close to 1,200 people. And I guess I'm going to echo a message that's in everyone's heart. And you're going to hear it loudly from them as well after I say it. We all love you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So here is a techie in the audience who, for some reason, I guess, can't get on Google. But here's an interesting question, though. So which town in India were your parents from? Um, My mom was from Didewada. My grandmother actually still lives there. Um, My dad, I'm actually not sure. Um, It's a really, really small town. Um, And I can't even even remember the name now. Um, but we, when we would visit, my sister and I, we would always go to the Dewada and send it with my grandparents. Cool. So usually in these question and answer sessions, I'm, I'm sure you've done a bit of preparation and uh, there's always been this thought. So I want to give you the opportunity here. Actually, no. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that every single interview, every single Q&A speech, anything that I do, um, it's all on my own. Um, I don't have a prep team. I don't have a team or people that write things for me or coach me or anything. Um, this is something, everything I say is 100% authentic and Nina, um, which was really important to me to keep that brand as well. Excellent. <clears throat> but, but I was going more uh, from, from the heart there, Nina, in terms of, you know what, these guys, I miss them. I really, really wish she's going to ask me this question. So if there was uh-huh. a question like that, what would that be? Oh my goodness. Um, I can't say I really have one, but um, if anything, if I could say something, it's just I want to say a genuine, heartfelt thank you from, to everyone for their love and support. Um, because this year wasn't, this year isn't necessarily about me. It's about reaching out to a new demographic, a new sample that's representative of Americans. And we are Americans, and I'm just so proud and honored. Um, to represent all of you. So thank you for, for the opportunity. Did you, did you hear that uh, round of applause? <laughs> I guess, I did. Thank I guess you. That, that is just uh, an embodiment of the very, very sincere thanks that everyone in this audience is, is feeling at this moment for you to have found the time, you know, given the weather situation, which was uh, kind, of, kind of unfortunate. Uh, yeah. Now we're going to take you back to your School, which was your favorite school subject? Uh, my favorite school subject was actually math. Um, I was always really good at math, and um, I, I say it with great pride because I think I was the only like, cheerleader, tennis player, marching band member who was also taking AP Calc CC. Um, so I was really proud of that. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, I didn't do a lot of math in college, but I, I did enjoy it in high school. And, and Nina, did uh, uh, you get a chance to uh, see uh, some of the work that the IIT AGH, the IIT Alumni of Greater Houston here uh, does? Uh, do, do, you, do you know something about that? Or? Actually, I'm not too familiar with it, um, but I'd love to learn. Okay, then uh, I, I wouldn't put you in the spot and ask you okay. questions of the IIT, IIT AGH. Uh, so here's another question for you. It says, as a girl, how has the University of Michigan experience helped you? And there's a rushed qualification. I'm a girl. Yeah, um, it's helped me immensely. I can't imagine being in this role without having my degree. Um, and anyone in the Miss America organization, you can compete between the ages of 18 and 24. Um, I'm right now 24, so I'm on the very end of the spectrum. But, um, I mean, you just learn so many life skills from it, whether it be, you know, being a leader. I was always involved um, on campus organizations. I was a part of the student government. Um, You just learn how to interact with people coming from such a diverse, um, you know, university. And um, just a lot of social skills that can't be taught in a classroom. You really learn attending college. 
and of course the alumni network has been amazing. I mean, to have that credential is also really great. No, very cool. So, uh, Nina, I tell you on behalf of the IIT 2013 Global Conference, I cannot tell you how much we have tremendously enjoyed your time and the fact that you've taken this time out in the, these nasty inclement conditions in Dallas. So, uh, with that, a huge thank you. I want to hear a thunderous round of applause for Nina, <laughs> Miss America. Thank you all so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, Nina. You take care, okay? Be safe. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Sunday. What a great interview. Let's give him another round of applause. We were able to coordinate that on short notice, and, and uh, it's a great, great opportunity to be able to visit with Nina. Uh, for our closing plenary, we'd like to welcome Desh Deshpande. Desh is uh, the chair of a National Council Initiative to support President Obama's innovation and entrepreneur strategy. An alumnus of IIT Madras, Desh serves, yep, there you go, give a shout out. Uh, Desh serves as a lifetime member of MIT Corporation and has contributed to the Deshpande Center for Technological Innovation at MIT. Desh is president and chairman of Sparta Group and a serial entrepreneur over the last three decades. Please join me in welcoming Desh Deshpande to the stage. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, John. Great. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> well, you know, as Nina said, she's a graduate of University of Michigan, and I was there three weeks ago when we both spoke at a conference, and she's a very impressive young lady. You know, for that young age, the maturity and the thoughtfulness that she has, she's probably doing more for branding India than almost anybody right now. So, so I think uh, she deserves a lot of praise from all of us. Well, I, um, I know this is the last piece, and, and last couple of days, uh, you know, it's been a great conference, and all these things that look so nice here, but if you walk in the back, it actually looks like the Houston Space Control Center. And, and for all these people to really put all this thing together, they've done an amazing job, so let's give them a big hand. You know, for the last couple of days, what I've been impressed with is the fact that the, all the IITNs, you know, all the investment that the IITs have made over the last 50 years, looks like it's really beginning to pay off. They're all beginning to not just talk about ideas, but how those ideas can have an impact. And, and so what I want to do is to, is to use maybe a context, see if I can put a framework. There are ideas, and the ideas can have impact on the developed economy, and they can also have impact on developing economy. By developed economy, I mean these are all loose definitions, not what the economists would define. In fact, most of my comments are going to be simple and commonsensical, because what I found in life is that simple things are very hard to do, and the hard things are impossible to do. So we really need to keep things simple. So by developed economy, I mean serving the customer base where people have disposable income and they can afford to buy things if you come up with a great idea. And that's a, that's a you know, it's, it's got an ecosystem. It's got access to capital, distribution channels, extremely competitive. But if you have a great idea, you plug it into that channel and then you have the impact. The developing economies are the ones where people don't really have the disposable income. They really can't afford things. And so for the great ideas to have impact on those set of people, uh, I think you have to look at it a little differently. So what I want to do today is to, you know, last few days we've heard a lot of great ideas and, and a lot of people are having tremendous impact over both segments of those markets. And so I just want to come up with a framework to talk a little bit about how we do this. And I'm going to mostly rely on my own experience. I'm a 1973 grad, came to Canada, taught for a year, got my PhD, worked in Toronto for four years for Motorola, 
moved to Boston 84, so I've been in Boston since 84, I did a bunch of companies, but I'm going to mostly draw on what I've done over the last 10 years. My wife Jayshree is also from IIT Madras, and for the last 10 years, we've been spending a lot of time in looking at how innovation entrepreneurship can have impact on both of those segments. So first we started off, I joined the board of MIT about 13 years ago, 2000. And so the first big initiative we did was set up a center at MIT, the Shpande Center for Technological Innovation. And the idea behind that was, you know, most of the companies we did in 70s, 80s, and early 90s, the core ideas came from places like Bell Labs. And by 2000, there wasn't a Bell Labs anymore because of, there were no more monopolies. So the center of gravity for idea generation had clearly moved back to universities. And US spends about $50 billion a year on university research and about $100 billion a year in federal research. And so the question is, you know, MIT, Stanford, Caltech, they already have a lot of impact, but can you do anything better? And so over the last 10 years, we've had a lot of success, and the idea behind this center and what we have done is pretty simple. It's, it just says that innovation plus relevance is equal to impact. If you want to have a great idea, have an impact on the world, it has to be directed to some burning problem in the world. And so the, the way innovation sort of economy works today is a little bit like engineering 50 years ago. People innovate the whole thing. The best among them patent the technology. And then the technology licensing offices try to peddle those ideas. As opposed to what we have done here is that if people have a desire for impact, connect their ideas to the marketplace up front so that as they bake the idea, it's more likely that the idea will have a pull in the marketplace. And, and so this formula of innovation plus relevance is equal to impact is something I think that applies to any sort of a innovation nurturing environment. That is, if you want to create innovation, if you want to create big ideas, you do have to create a nurturing environment for people because you cannot mandate innovation. So whether it's a think tank, uh, university, or any of these places, where you get a lot of smart people together and put them together and, and want them to have an impact. But what happens is that, you know, let's say for a MIT, MIT has about a thousand faculty, out of which there's about 50 of them who are more Nobel Prize kind of guys. And they don't really care about impact. They're in it for the beauty of the idea. And we need to fund them and leave them alone because their ideas will have profound impacts maybe 15, 20 years from now. But 95% of the people always want to have an impact. But what happens is that if they have an idea today, if you go talk to them two months from now, they'll have 10 more ideas. And so the question is, how do you help them pick and choose which of these ideas to pursue? But what happens is that these nurturing environments over the course of time tend to move further and further away from the real world. And as they move further away from the real world, uh, they become clubby. And when they become clubby, when they have to pick and choose which of these 10 ideas to pursue, they pick an idea which impresses each other as opposed to having the impact. And so if you really want those ideas to have an impact, you somehow have to have a very conscious way to connect innovation to relevance. And so, and, and so this, over the last 10 years, has been a pretty successful program. And, and in fact, uh, National Science Foundation, which spends about $7.4 billion, has, has embraced the same methodology and, and uh, rolled out uh, Innovation Corp. So big ideas having impact on the developed market is something that a lot of the people in this room do, a lot of the entrepreneurs do it, and so on. So let me really talk a little bit more about the other part, which has been an interesting journey for the last eight, 10 years for us. So about eight years ago, after we had success at the MIT Center, we said, what can we do about this in India? And so instead of picking technological innovation, we chose to work on social innovation. And so for social innovation to happen, uh, we, for innovation to happen, you need a critical mass. So we picked an area, uh, which also happens to be our hometown, uh, north of Bangalore, between Bangalore and Mumbai, which is Hubli, Dharwar. So we chose about five districts, and it has about 10 million people. And so it's large enough to have all kinds of issues, like irrigated land, arid land, small towns, small villages, bigger towns. And so it's, it's rich enough to have all kinds of issues, but it's small enough to create a critical mass. 
and, and we built a center. So this center is, is built in Hubli in, near the engineering college. And, and what we find there over the last eight years is that for social innovation to be impactful, the equation gets turned around. It's really relevance plus innovation is equal to impact. Meaning, you have to start with the deep understanding of the problem itself, and then you bring whatever new idea that you need to solve that problem. The new idea that you bring to solve the problem does not have to be patentable, first time in the world, huge competitive advantage, and so on. You know, whereas in the other market, if you don't have a very profound idea, if you don't have a huge competitive advantage, if you don't have a patentable technology, it's very hard to compete. But that's not the essence here. The essence is to really make something to understand deeply what the problem is and, and apply to that part of it. We have had over 100 young men and women from US, uh, age anywhere from 20 to 30, uh, go and spend time in the sandbox. And, and, but then, very early on, we realized that the social innovation does not happen unless you have local leadership. So we started a program a few years ago to, to really develop this local leadership. So we have a lot of programs to develop local entrepreneurship and so on. And we also started a program for four college kids coming together and picking a problem to solve and any problem they find. And so we have 10,000 students now doing 2,500 projects, which is massively critical mass. And then we, we are working with about 50 social interventions and we treat them the same way uh, you would do uh, a startup. You know, you find out what is the intervention, what is the new thing that you're trying to do, you hone it down, and then if you get it right, then you find a model to scale it. And so what I want to do is to, is to maybe compare and contrast uh, what is the difference between starting these, uh, these ideas having an impact on one part of the economy versus the other part of the economy. So if you have a nonprofit and for-profit, organizations in both these sectors essentially get started by some entrepreneur. And, and entrepreneurs usually, you know, are crazy. Uh, some crazy guy starts, has an idea, and he starts in the for-profit world. In the nonprofit world, they have to be crazier because it's so much harder, right? But in the for-profit world, what happens is that doesn't matter how crazy the entrepreneur is, he has to somehow, over the course of time, find a solution, a product or a service, where somebody is willing to pay. If he doesn't, either the company goes bankrupt or there's merger and acquisition, but the company does not exist. So in the free market economy, in the for-profit world, because of the intense competition, only performing assets survive. And even if you get a start, there's no guarantee that you survive, right? Because you have to come up with your 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, because there's always another guy who's chasing you. So in the for-profit world, execution excellence is given. If you don't execute, you know, most of the people in this room work in that sector, and if you don't get up in the morning and, and really excel in what you do, there's no way you can compete. You're out, you're out of business, right? So execution excellence is absolutely given in that part of the market. In the nonprofit world, compassion is given. You know, nobody goes through that big hassle, and we have a lot of people in this room who actually stuck their necks out and started these organizations and they have given their whole life. They would not do that without having the deep compassion. But at the same time, whether the intervention that you come up with whether it's optimal or not, you won't know because the beneficiary does not have the ability to pay in most of the cases. And when the beneficiary does not have the ability to pay, you don't have that natural feedback loop. And you don't have an active marketplace where the beneficiary can use his resources to go to different places. And so it becomes a little bit harder to figure out whether the intervention that you're doing is the right intervention or not. In fact, a lot of the nonprofits over the course of time, just to survive, have to be nicer to their donors than they are with the beneficiaries, right? Because, because they have to somehow get the money and survive. Now, the total number of nonprofits in both US and India is about 1.4 million. 
it is 1.4 million odd NGOs. But unfortunately, that whole space, both in US and India, is a land of the living dead. Because a nonprofit never dies. There's no bankruptcy, there's no mergers and acquisitions, because they can just continue to survive whatever they limp along, and they do what they need to do. And so, but the good news in India is that when you see IITs getting involved with these organizations, it's amazing how well they're doing. So out of the 1 point million odd NGOs in India, I would say there's probably maybe a thousand of them which are sort of performing, out of which about 100 of them are very good. Maybe about 20 of them are excellent. In fact, we have a lot of them in this room, whether it's uh, Pradhan or Pratham or Ekal or, uh, or Anudeep or uh, uh, any of these organizations that we have heard over the last three, four days. You know, those are the ones that stand out. But even they don't have that natural competition. They somehow have to go out of their way to somehow bring that execution excellence into, into their organizations. That is, the donors you know, are very interested in knowing what happens and how their money gets used, but it's very different intensity of involvement as opposed to somebody buying a stock in a, in a, in a company. When a stockholder, you know, they are very intense in terms of making sure that the company works and so on. So if there is a way we can bring the same intensity of involvement of other people into the nonprofits to make sure that they care enough about that nonprofit and, and, and inject that execution excellence, I think we can see magic happen. And uh, quite a bit of it is happening in, in, in India. So, so let me just do this one minute video. This is not a, a commercial for Akshay Patra, but just to tell you what's possible. Uh, I think, I think most of you know about Akshay Patra. Anybody who doesn't know about Akshay Patra? Okay, most of you know. So the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, this is an organization that can actually provide a midday meal, a hot midday meal to school children for about $30 a year, right? Which means, you know, we talk about how hard hunger is in, in whether it's in India, Africa, or whatever. So let's say two meals would be $60 and a billion people would be a $60 billion, which is nothing compared to the current economy. But most of the, you know, President Fox yesterday talked about how we have a lot of food, but it gets wasted. So if you put the right logistics, uh, engineering, accounting, uh, process, nutrition, all this stuff, these problems are not very hard to solve. I mean, the world that we live in, where it's so competitive and you're fighting so hard to just get a little bit of an edge, if you can just bring a little bit of that caliber to solving these problems, these problems are not that hard to solve. So uh, let, me, uh, let, me, let me skip things here. So, so I just talked about, I mentioned a whole bunch of other organizations that are doing well. And, and, but, but even then, I think, I think we have a, long, a little bit more ways to go. For example, you know, in, a, in the for-profit world, on a scale of zero to 10, an excellent company is like 10. A company that's making pretty good profits is probably nine. 
a company that's profitable is about eight, seven is probably break even, six probably is losing money, and anything less than six would be bankrupt, right? On, a, on an execution scale of zero to 10. If you look at the nonprofits, I would say the best among them would maybe come up to five. Why? Because, you know, poor guys, they're under-resourced, there's just not enough resources. It's not like you can just go out and hire a lot of talent. And so the way you can get them up to 10 is by IITNs getting involved. You know, and a lot of the people now, uh, you know, are, are bringing their talents in. Uh, they're volunteering, they're bringing their expertise, not just the checkbook. And, and so anything we can do to actually get their performance up to 10, I mean, can we have a Google and an Apple in, in nonprofit world, right? And, and it's something that's happening in, in India actually is, is very exciting compared to even US. You know, we, we do a lot of work here in US, and US isn't there either. Because what happens in US is that most of the interventions in US are very expensive because they're, again, driven more by the donor than the people who benefit from it. And so let's say the best STEM education intervention in India in US would be like 4,000 children, whereas we need to really impact 40 million children. So thinking about scale and, and coming up with solutions that have the right cost model and the right scaling methodology up front is something that India can actually become a role model for the whole world, I think. And so we are working with about 50 other interventions in the sandbox, and we are finding that, but that a lot of these will scale. Like Agastya, it, it's now teaching science to a million rural children, and three of the village teams won the Intel Science Award last year. So all it takes is just a little bit of help to these people to actually you know, get up there, right? Uh, so it's important to think about these nonprofits when you take the intervention to make sure that you have a sustainable model. So you make any of these interventions sustainable by three ways. Some interventions lend themselves to free market, in which case the beneficiary can actually pay, and he pays more than what it costs. Uh, sometimes you're just bringing innovation to the government program because government is the one that spends the most amount of money trying to help these people. Or you make a very broad-based charity. You don't get the checks from one or two people, but you get from millions of people or a combination of all the three. And, and if you think about this up front, then you're always in a better position. You know, one of the worst things that happens in nonprofits is that nonprofits get started, somebody really likes it, writes a big million dollar check, the nonprofit goes ahead, builds, builds all the infrastructure to scale, and then there's fatigue, and they, the money dries up. When it dries up, you're just stuck with all this infrastructure, and, and you're worse off now than you were before you got that million dollar check. And so thinking about sustainability and how you're actually going to do this long-term planning and scale it the right way is, is very important. Now, you know, when we started the effort in India, we thought US needs technological innovation, India needs social innovation. And then about three years ago, we realized that US needs just as much social innovation and India needs technological innovation. So we brought this sandbox concept back to the United States. So we have a sandbox in US and one in Canada, and all the same principles apply to the same thing here. You know, people who are below the poverty line, they cannot, they should not be waiting for Washington to help them. They just need to get going and do things for themselves. And so what, what can all of us do? You know, I think some of you are, are very intensely pursuing startups. You should, because I think anybody who starts a company and hires tens of people, hundreds of people, thousands of people, I mean, that's the best social service you could be doing, creating a livelihood for people. But at the same time, as you pursue that passion and build these companies, make sure you don't lose your compassion, because it's important. It's important that you care about the people around you, care for the environment, care for the animals, and, and so don't lose that compassion. And, and, you know, some of the people, some of the IATNs have jumped right into starting social ventures, and we have a few of them in the room. But there's a lot of others who actually want to help. And we, when we want to help these people, let's make sure that, you know, what I, you know, most of us, when we want to help people, 
we always lead with what we know best. And what people in this room know is innovation, technology. And so a lot of times we get very excited about a solution and then try to take it there. So that's innovation plus relevance. That's not what works in social venture. So let's say you have a clean water technology and you want to serve just a million people. If you want to serve a million people, first you have to make those million people aware that they need clean water, which is a job. And then let's say you, you have an entrepreneur who can serve 1,000 people. So you need 1,000 entrepreneurs. And to run those 1,000 people, you need maybe 100 and then a 10, and then maybe a couple of people who can actually come up with technology. But if you are trying to serve the people who live on $2 a day, those entrepreneurs can be maybe $5 a day, and then maybe $10 a day, maybe 50. So it, it, it takes a lot of people and a lot of local contextualization and a lot of local leadership to actually for these innovations to happen. So co-creating the solutions and lighting the flame in the people to actually solve their own problems is, is the most important thing. And what I'm really excited about, you know, spending the last two days, one of the things that I saw is that I never heard anybody talk about negative things. You know, things are broken, whether it's Delhi or Washington, everything is messed up. But I think entrepreneurs, IITNs, are, have two qualities that we should not lose. One is being a little naive, naive about the fact that you can actually solve the problems, which may or may not be true. And secondly, being irrationally optimistic that you can actually do something about these things. And, and that's not a bad way to live. Because if you live your whole life feeling that tomorrow is going to be better than today, you'll be a happy person. And if you're happy, you make everybody else around you happy. And that's what makes it a better world. So I really want to thank all of you for being so engaged in, in, in finding ways. I think it's a learning experience for all of us in terms of how we make best use of the resources, the talents, and energy that we have to actually create the biggest impact in this world. Thank you, and thank you very much. Desh, thanks so much for that great talk. On behalf of the IIT 2013 conference, please accept this token of our appreciation. Let's give him another round of applause. And we'd also like to take a moment to present Desh with the Pan IIT 2013 Social Entrepreneurship Award. Please welcome the president of Pan IIT, Mr. Sid Chowdhury, to present the award. Congratulations, Desh. Thank you very much.